Fred Chang. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak here. It's, it's been a great series. Um, uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, the regulation of cell density um, in the fission yeast cell cycle. Is slides looking okay? Yes? Okay. All right, so what we really want to talk about today is what is life. And I think um, a lot of textbook examples have been like from Biochemistry 101 is that you, you have a protein that, that whose uh, activities really uh, depend on the concentration of that protein. And, but all these studies are done basically in dilute solutions, so like tubulin in water. And what in life, what really happens inside the cell is much more complicated, right? So the current models of the cytoplasm uh, really show a very crowded milieu uh, filled with macromolecules that are jostling with each other. They're so crowded that they actually can deform each other. And so you can imagine that it's very difficult uh, for, for things to actually move around in, in such an environment. Um, and so my lab has been interested in um, studying this cytoplasm and how does it impact cellular, the cell biology uh, in, in, real, in living cells. Um, so we're asking questions such as how does the crowded nature of the cytoplasm actually impact uh, cell biological processes and how is this density actually regulated? So there are many cases where um, the density uh, might be changing. All right, so um, as I said, density uh, is not always constant. It could be changing. And um, as I'll tell you today, the changes in the cell cycle, but also changes in many other contexts too, such as um, in response to stresses, some physiological responses, even during differentiation. So there's a case where in um, cartilage cells, they actually uh, become two times less dense as they um, differentiate. Now these changes in density may affect uh, cellular physiology uh, globally. And so what I mean by that is when your density is changing, the concentration of all your cytoplasmic components are changing. So this could be changing you know, your concentration of your favorite molecule. It also affects uh, the movement of, of, of um, things inside the cell, um, i.e. diffusion. And um, the crowded nature of the cytoplasm with the macromolecules actually have additional effects, um, which have been termed colloidosmotic pressures, which um, exerts uh, effects such as excluded bond effects, which affect the effective concentration of, of proteins, as well as mechanical effects on other molecules and on organelles, and also um, to, to promote a phase separation. Okay, so so we've set off to sort of um, understand these uh, properties of cytoplasm in a simple model organism, so S. pombi. This is something my lab has been working on uh, ever since I started my uh, postdoc, I guess. Um, and it's really a great tool for quantitative biology. As, as you can see, it looks a lot like an E. coli cell, but it's 100 times bigger. It's a eukaryote. Um, and as, as in budding yeasts, it's very tractable. And um, what's really wonderful about it is that it's easy to measure its, its dimensions and um, it's highly reproducible. So the shapes and sizes and their cell cycles are all extremely um, reproducible. Okay, so, so when I talk about density, what we really mean is uh, basically the mass over the volume of the cell. And so, during the cell cycle, as the cells are growing, um, they need to double their mass and their volume um, before dividing, okay? So today I'll be talking about mass growth, which is basically how much all the insides of the cells increase uh, as cells grow. So the cells are making more proteins, making more organelles, things like that. And this is uh, related, but can be distinguished from volume growth, which is basically how bigger, how much, bigger the cells are getting as they grow. Um, and so this may, at least in our yeast, has something to do with how big, quickly you're building the cell wall and things like that. Now, normally um, mass growth and volume growth are somehow coupled with each other. Um, so to maintain density, basically mass growth and volume growth have to go about the same speed. Um, so what happens if they're not? Well, if 
mass growth is slower than the volume growth, then the cytoplasm will dilute. And if mass growth is, is proceeding faster than the rate of volume growth, then the cytoplasm will concentrate. Okay. Um, and so to maintain, to maintain density, um, we're thinking how, how are these two uh, processes actually coordinated with each other? And so there might be very tight feedback. So it's um, something in the cell might be basically uh, looking at um, the density constantly and then adjusting the translational machinery, for instance. Or um, there might be very little feedback. And basically, these two processes are set about at the, about the same similar rates. And, um, and this is, uh, this happens to be right. So I guess one thing to delve into these mechanisms, regulatory mechanisms, is first, is it possible to actually couple, uncouple mass growth and volume growth? So um, a couple years ago now, we published a paper which we call super growth, um, in which we accidentally found a way to decouple volume and mass growth. Um, and so we're playing around with these osmotic oscillations, which causes cells to grow very slowly. And, but we found that mass uh, growth continued. And so the cells got more and more dense um, to the fact that even your typical GFP uh, in the cell rose in concentration um, to 20 to 50%. And then um, after they're released from these oscillations, the cell, um, started doing something really strange. It started growing really fast, about twice as fast as normal. And this uh, eventually over a couple of cell cycles led to um, a reduction of the density down back to normal. Okay, so uh, this was a, a striking example to us that density can change and showed us that these volume growth and mass growth can be decoupled from each other. Okay, so um, we were pretty intrigued by these findings, but people kept on asking us, um, well, what does this have to do with the normal cell cycle? I mean, osmotic oscillations are pretty unusual perturbation. And so um, I'll be telling you about a work from a very talented uh, postdoc, Pascal Odermott. Um, and he worked with me as well as with Casey Wong at Stanford and along with these other folks here, looking at the normal uh, regulation of cell density during the cell cycle. Okay. So um, what Pascal did was to first team up with an optical engineer and uh, devised a new way of measuring um, dry mass density using quantitative phase imaging. Now, there are many ways of doing quantitative phase imaging or QPI, um, but he, he found a way which was a uh, pretty low tech, which is basically just to take a Z stack of bright field images like this and then um, basically put it through the computer, which calculates phase shifts um, using this equation, um, and then calibrating these phase shifts uh, using uh, cells dunked into various concentrations of DSA. Um, and so what you get out of it then is a pixel by pixel image of, of dry mass density in the cell um, that um, that's pretty high resolution and you can see uh, various features inside the cell. So the average uh, density of um, Pombi at least is about 280 mg per mil. So what's really great about this method is that we can now take movies of density um, in living cells, um, which is something that my lab loves to do. And so in this movie, uh, purple is less dense, orange is more dense. And I hope you can see that as the cells are dividing and growing that um, there's different patterns of density going on that not all the cell have the exact same density. So I'll be in the subsequent talk then, I'll be talking about various features of this movie. Okay, so the first thing we noticed was that the density uh, changes during the cell cycle in almost every cell that we looked at. Um, and so I should remind you that in the cell cycle, uh, Pombi cells are growing from the cell tips here, 
and um, they get longer and longer during G2 phase and they stop growing during mitosis and cytokinesis. Um, so this is sort of seen in this kind of graph here where they're steadily growing at an almost exponential rate here. And then they sort of level off during mitosis and cytokinesis. Now the density that we measure from this QPI shows a dip, uh, steady dip of um, density as the cells are growing, but then they start to rise here um, during mitosis and cytokinesis at the same point where the, the growth stops um, increasing in volume. And so if we can calculate the mass from this, what appears is that the mass is continually increasing at an exponential clip throughout the cell cycle. Um, so what this says is that mass, the synthesis of mass here is not being regulated during cell cycle. It's continuous through the whole thing, but, uh, but the volume control is. Um, there are regulatory programs that are telling your, your POMPI cells to grow or not in volume. Um, and therefore the density of is, is changing uh, because of this regulation. Um, okay. So we noted one other change in density, which occurred right at the beginning of the cell cycle, which wasn't included in that previous analysis, in which um, right at the beginning of the cell cycle, we have a Here's that the cell at the very end, it has a, um, it's about to divide. There's a septum here, which is then digested away. And the two cells then are, two daughter cells are born here. And there's an abrupt change in cell shape, as you can see at this area here. And the volume increases about 5%. Um, so measuring density during this process, uh, Pascal found that the density actually decreases about 5%. And so from this, um, we can surmise that um, what's maybe happening here is that during this process that the cells are swelling due to influx of water. And this is what, this causes the cell to change the shape as well as um, to decrease its density. So next we wanna tell what happens during the cell cycle uh, when we arrest the cell cycle. Um, and in Pompey, we have these uh, very nice, well-characterized temperature-sensitive mutants in the CDC genes, uh, which arrest the cells at particular points in the cell cycle. So first, uh, we arrested cells at G2 phase um, using the CDC25 mutant. And these mutants, the cells continue then to grow. They don't enter mitosis, so they continue to grow and grow. Um, um, and become very long, these, and become these very long cells. And you can see even from this images that they get more and more purple, meaning they're um, losing density here. And so you can see here um, that the density does sort of gradually decrease as the cells are going longer. All right. So this is a case showing that you're growing faster in volume than you are in mass and then you're losing, volume, losing density. Um, so conversely, if we uh, delay the cells in mitosis, then the cells get more dense. So this is a case where the cells are not growing, but mass continues. And you can see that the cells are getting more orange here. And you can see from these density maps that um, they also are increasing. And the same goes for arrest and cytokinesis. The cells are not growing. The cells are actually accumulating here, building septa over and over again. Um, and the density actually, uh, rises pretty impressively during this process as mass is continuing to, to increase. Okay, so this led to a hypothesis that uh, maybe all you need to increase the density is just to inhibit uh, volume growth, right? So we've seen this in the normal cell cycle and cell cycle rests. And from um, the supergrowth paper, we also showed osmotic oscillations and Griffin A did the similar thing. Um, but we really wanted a very clean example for this. And um, so the, the most sort of uh, abrupt way we can um, uh, inhibit uh, volume growth is to use uh, a drug, latrunculin, which is an actin inhibitor. And so when you treat POMB cells with latrunculin, uh, the cells basically stop in their tracks. They don't grow anymore in any phase of the cell cycle. And, um, and they all then become more and more dense 
no matter where they are in the cell cycle, as you can see here. Um, and so basically the density increases. Okay, so a second feature of um, these density patterns was that um, we saw these intriguing spatial densities, gradients of densities. Um, so Pombe cells have what we call a new end and an old end of the cell. So the new end was where it just divided and the old end is where it used to be the end. And cells generally grow more at the old end than at the new end. And you can see that uh, there's a density of gradient, of, sorry, gradient of density here. Um, in which the old end or the growing end is usually less dense than the new end. Um, and so there's a strong correlation with uh, the growing tip basically being less dense. Um, and that this asymmetry is perpetuated throughout uh, cell division and even passed down to the daughter cells. Okay, oh, I forgot to mention that we also see this uh, gradient not only using QPI, but also for staining uh, for total protein and RNA as well. So it's something uh, perhaps protein-based, although we really don't know the basis for this gradient yet. Okay, and then finally, um, we have some initial results showing that there's homeostasis that um, maintains density. So our measurements are showing that, um, you know, this in this histogram that there's a, a very narrow distribution of, of density is about uh, with the CV about six percent, um, which is a pretty impressive way to to um, keep this to maintain this density, and so um, we're asked to to see whether there might be homeostatic mechanisms, and so we found that if we plot density at the beginning of the cell cycle here, with the density changed during the cell cycle, that there was this inverse relationship. So basically the denser cells here tended to then um, lose um, density over this whole cell cycle versus ones which were um, uh, less dense to start with, <clears throat> tended to um, gain density over the whole, whole cell cycle. Um, and so this is sort of the basis of a self-correcting mechanism or a um, homeostasis behavior. All right, so um, next we want to see whether variations in density actually matter. Um, and um, Pascal is very interested in the mechanical aspects of the cell. And so we wondered whether um, density might affect the mechanical um, cell mechanics of these cells. And so, what we found is that uh, the density differences actually correlate with intracellular pressure. And so Pompey, we have a situation where we have a, basically a force sensor that's, um, that can be used uh, in which basically in cells that have a septum, um, that the septum can act as a, as a pressure gauge. Basically uh, the septum itself is a, you know, it's a piece of cell wall that's elastic. And so if there's higher pressure on one side than the other, then this, this um, cell wall will bend towards uh, the side that's less uh, dense, less with less pressure. And we found that in all these different cases here that um, you can see that the septum is let's say, bulging away from this, this, the region that is more dense. Um, and we even have an example here in which uh, the septum changes its uh, bulging direction because which correlates with the change in, in the differences between density in the two compartments. So um, this suggests that uh, there's higher pressure than uh, in the compartments with higher density. Uh, so um, how might this be? It, there's, um, it's pretty complicated, but there is evidence that um, macromolecules can produce what's called colloid osmotic pressure um, to, and this, an this is an example then possibly of demonstrating that um, this colloid osmotic pressure is real and it can actually affect cell shapes. 
All right. So um, in summary, um, we've used a, a new method of uh, quantitative phase imaging to measure dry mass density. Um, we notice these cell cycle changes in density, and we had to have a mechanism in which basically these changes in density come around by the cells basically uh, regulating their volume growth. Um, it's exacerbated in cell cycle rests, and so people use things like uh, are changing their rests, are changing using a cell cycle rest to um, synchronize cell cycles. For instance, they could have um, um, unintended consequences on the density. Um, we see these spatial uh, gradients of density related to tip growth. And finally, we see this intriguing um, correlation of density with intracellular pressures. And so just some take homes are that um, I hope that uh, this talk has um, illustrated for you that cytoplasmic density is really a new parameter that uh, that should be considered um, in your models and things like that. Um, it's not only density, but also other properties of the cytoplasm, such as viscosity and effective temperatures and things like that, which can really affect how cellular processes work. Um, and one important part about this is that the density actually changes. So in the cell cycle we've shown here, also during stress responses and differentiation, various metabolic states and quiescence. And so there could be significant differences um, in cytoplasmic states, which then have large consequences of how cells work. In our studies, we're showing a, a, a relationship between growth regulation and density in, in terms of what growth can regulate density and then vice versa, density can also regulate um, this uh, speed of growth. And, um, and that density re regulation could be through growth rates, but also through um, things like water swelling, water regulation. Um, yeah, and then there are potentially global effects of density then on various processes. Um, oh, I forgot to point out that, yeah, so in mammalian cells, for instance, it's starting to be shown that, um, you know, not all the cells in our body have the same density. For instance, this is an example from the Kirshner lab showing that indeed that like these neurons um, are much more dense than the surrounding ones. Okay, and then so I'm, I don't have time to talk about all these other projects today, but various projects in the lab are dealing with the effects of intracellular density on cell biological processes. And so for instance, Arthur um, in the lab has a very nice story um, on bioarchives now, which in, in which the cytoplasm is dampening the, the rates of microtubule dynamics. All right, so um, that's it. I'd like to thank the people who did the work. Most of this work is done by Pascal Odermott um, in collaboration with Casey Wong. And so good, I thank you for attention and I look forward to discussing this with you. Well, thank you, it was a very nice presentation. I have a few questions in the chat. The first one is from Jin Yang and he asks, what's the special res spatial resolution of your technique for density? Um, for finding the density of the cell, the local density. So it's basically the resolution of um, the light microscope. Um, so yeah, we like to think it's it's down to that level. Probably under a micron. Oh yes, certainly under a micron. Um, um, so Eric Dufresne asks if you have had the chance to look how overall density correlates to mobility or diffusion of specific proteins. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, we, we've actually been, been probing diffusion using um, these gem particles, which are basically ribosomes in size, like 40 nanometers in diameter. Um, and so that's something that we have to do more carefully now, looking in sort of spatial and temporal regulation, regulation of that. But. It's not a trivial experiment. So I had a question. Um, when the cell divides, it it looks like the daughter cells have less less density. Uh, is is there a phase where the membrane grows and grows, and then the daughter has a, sm a smaller density? Otherwise, the the total surface 
uh, would be bigger for two daughters than for one mother cell, right? Um, as a cell, so when the cells divide, they and then they pop out, and so the surface area also increases a little bit when they do this. Is that? I'm not yeah. So sure. so the surface area increases. Uh, so it has to grow, right? It's yes. Yeah, for two gigams. And then that density doesn't. Okay, we can discuss about it later. So from Patrick McCall, he says the density increased to 400 milligram per milliliter upon arrest around mitosis is impressive. How long can the cells sustain these densities? How do they get sick? Do they get yeah, sick? So, okay. Um, good question. Uh, I mean, these cells ultimately, if they stay arrested, they'll they'll die. Um, but we haven't we haven't analyzed the sort of terminal <laughs> effects of that density increases. Um, but that's certainly one reason why they could be dying. Um, they also start to swell and things like that, so they, and then lice. So from David Lubensky, are your changes in density mostly due to changes in cytosolic density or to something like changes in the number of organelles with especially high density? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, that's sort of the next things we have to look at. We really don't know. Like, uh, so for instance, the spatial gradient of density, it could simply be that there are more organelles um, in one part of the cell than the other. Um, and so this is something that we have to look at further. Um, okay. And then is it possible to observe flows or coordinated motion inside the cells due to density, to the density gradient? And that was- um, Yeah. Like that. Um, again, we, we haven't seen using sort of microbiology things, we haven't seen any directed flows, but we haven't looked carefully enough. Um, I think the dogma is that in yeast that there are no flows, but um, we'll see. 